Hello, I'm Menoth John. And I'd like to welcome you. First of all, let me take just a moment to thank you for allowing me back into your homes. If this is your first time with us, let me extend a personal invitation for you to drag out your miniatures and paint along with us each week. Let's go over to the canvas here and let's get started. I believe, I believe, every day's a good day when you paint. I believe, I believe, it'll bring a lot of good thoughts to your heart. I believe, I believe. Every day's a good day when you paint. I believe, I believe, it will bring a lot of good thoughts to your heart. Let's build a happy little cloud. Let's build some happy little trees. There are no limits here. We start out by believing here. You can almost paint with anything. All you have to do is practice. There are no limits here. By believing here, this is your world. You're the creator. Find freedom on this canvas. Believe that you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Give it a little touch. Give it a little push. Make love to the canvas. Love to the Give it a little touch. Give it a little push. Push it. Push it. Caress it. Very gentle. Very gentle. Very grand. Oh yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, and it is time for take two of the Sunday Night Extravaganza. Another fantastic technical beginning, and the damn thing did it again. Honest to God, is it because I have Chrome open? I don't. I don't understand what's going on. Okay, so now all of a sudden it likes it because I stopped recording and then I started doing it again. Huh. Okay. Strange. Now let's see if it if it it lets it's fine then after that and nobody knows why. And so now I've got this quandary, John, Mr. Co-host with the host, Mr. John Spencer, that if I load this thing up onto YouTube in its current form. It's gonna have a heart attack, or I, or maybe I can stitch it together with one of my programs. Either way, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Painting with Menoth John, your technologically challenged podcast. I'm Menoth John, and I, with me as always, is the co-ho host with the mo ho host, Mr. John Spencer. Say hello to the brushheads, Mr. John Spencer. Hey, brushheads. <laughs> you know something. Oh. <laughs> As I cough into the into the microphone, because nothing's better than that. Um, 
I am going to uh, I'm going to lead off with a beverage update because, for God's sakes, after two takes of this garbage, I need some cracking. So here's to you, John. You're the best co-host in the world, and here's to the brushheads, the best fans in the world. Hey, hey Ron. Ron. Boy, it's been a long time since we've had that level of f up on the entrance into the show. Yeah, well, you know, once in a while, it's going to happen. Computers. So, what I was trying to do was I was trying to get the chat room open on the on the monitor over here so that I could actually like monitor the chat room and be interactive, you know, like we were last time that we did this. And lo and behold, now seems to be screwing with OBS some for some reason. So. Um, I will not be as interactive with the chat room as I would like to be, John. I'll try to take care of it for you. All right. Well, you are the best in the business, and so I'm sure we'll do fine. Um, got a few news and announcements, but first off, we want to thank Discount Games Incorporated uh, of the greater Idaho Falls metropolitan area, uh, a, a teeming metropolis of nearly 60,000 people, but the home of Discount Games Incorporated and Gameopolis, the game store that makes it all happen. We would like to thank them for their sponsorship of the Pending with Menoth John show. Without him, uh, there would be, I guess it would still be a show, but uh, yeah. there would be. Um, it would Less Dozer and Smig? Yeah, there would be less Dozer and Smig, and it would cost more to do the show. So there you go. Uh, but yeah. if you don't have a, uh, a, if you don't have a local gaming store in which to buy your Dozer and Smig, uh, you know, I think I think Dozer and Smig say it best. Buy me from Jay at Discount Games because you'll get like thirty percent off, and it's like no shipping charges for like fifty bucks if you get that much stuff. And you should get me. I'm like thirty bucks or something. So that's been a, a message from Dozer and Smig uh, for Discount Games Incorporated. So there you go. Um, hey, John, you played some games this week. That means we get to have some some deep thoughts with John Spencer. John. Yes, I did. I got uh, I got four games in actually. Well, while you talk about the first of your games, I'm going to put on the official blue painting with men off John rubber glove, <laughs> and uh, we'll get into some painting here. And I'll switch it over here, hopefully successfully, to the painting cam there we go so tell me a little bit about your game there mr john spencer all right well i'm actually talk about a pair at once because they're two casters and they'll probably go pretty quick sounds good um the first pair uh was the two i played with viros 2 viros 2 i yes. played against uh against uh buoy the first time at this circle playing balder 2 and the second time i played against uh joe playing his cane 2 list and uh uh, they were pretty diametrically opposite, even though I won both games by, uh, by, well, one was caster assassination, the other one was uh, my opponent conceding, but it probably would have been scenario in that case. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the deep thought is, if you don't know what something does, like Joe had no idea what my list was supposed to do, just keep going. you got to keep playing the game. You can't just shut down. That's very true. His, his want to shut down sometimes and go like, I, I don't want to deal with this, throw his hands up in the air and just get frustrated rather than just keep shooting stuff. Because I mean, he did a fair amount of damage. He pretty much decimated by his victors. Um, but also not thinking and not, uh, uh, and not uh, really planning out what to do because being frustrated, I took him out of his game. So he couldn't continue what he normally does, because he plays that list pretty well, usually. But he just, he ran his uh, crazy uh, hammer dwarves forward and, and let me hide behind the wall so he couldn't charge me. Oh, that's not going to work out Which well. Which is bad. Yeah, because yeah, hammer dwarves versus griffins without a charge is not that good. Nope, not at all. So yeah, I, I crush things. I mean... Uh, he didn't protect Alexia well enough. He had Alexia in the Risen. Uh, I managed to evict her out, which is good. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's, you got to keep playing the game because, on the other hand, uh, Bowie managed to keep his head about him and kill quite a few of the Light Jacks. 
Yeah, you know, that's I just mean, that, that's exactly the thing. I mean, you know, you never know when you're going to get given an opportunity to to get yourself back into a game. And if you if you don't keep your head up, that's just never going to happen. Yep. And if you keep your wits about you, you can be in a position to have a chance. Because uh, Paul was, uh, Bowie was about, you know, a quarter of an inch, half an inch out of having good assassination run on me during one turn. He just, uh, it just didn't happen. I'd place things just right for him not to get me. Nope, but, uh, you know, he so he kept himself in the game by keeping his head together, even though, you know, things were not necessarily going his way the entire time. Yep, makes a lot of sense. And Joe, yeah, and then Joe, on the other hand, uh, just lost it. I mean, he's still a newer player, but he needs to keep his head about him. That's a, that's and, a, real, uh, that's a real skill, is, is that the mental part of the game is something that comes with time. And... It's so easy to to let yourself get flustered in a situation where y you you think your back's up against the wall, but you just got to keep on plugging. Yeah, even if it's against someone who like you don't have a good record against or anything, you know, even like if you're in a national tournament, you go up against JVM. Just keep going. Don't don't let him get in your head because if because that point, if you lose to the player without the game being involved, you're done. I mean. Well, you, you mean to go, oh, he's JVM, I can't beat him. The biggest part of JVM is how do you not fall in love with the guy at the table? I mean, you know, he bats, them, I, he bats them eyes at you, and he's got that hair, and it's like, oh, man, I'll tell you what, that's some good stuff right there. He's got the best metagame in the business. Yep. So that's a deep thought, and uh, the other deep thought from this list is, man, bird's eye is bullshit. <laughs> bird's eye is freaking broke as hell. Because... <laughs> Well, Joe asked me, like, hey, uh, you, you can't see through forest or anything. I'm like, no, no, I can't. I'm like, wait, let me check. Oh, oh yeah, 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 I can totally see through yeah, forest. As a, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, they offer you no protection whatsoever. Because these, 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 these jacks over here got Pathfinder, too. Yeah, that's... Yep, so bir bird's eye is totally that. a thing. I, I won both. Uh, I figured the Joe's list would probably have ended in, uh, in a scenario because I was... There was a zone. I was totally crushing it you know there were like two risen left in the zone and they were about three seconds away from dying yep so at the point where he's like all right you know what you've got this game let's just clean up and go home yeah so, that was my first pair of games well you know it's interesting you to bring up uh keeping your head together and keep on plugging because i had a game that kind of exemplified that to a certain extent too i went to uh iowa city because Stephen groom who uh, is the, the press ganger there actually went so far as to schedule a, uh, a a tournament to match up with my uh with my custody schedule so he i, I there's no way in Iowa City's like 4 hours from where I live but there was no way that given all the histrionics he did to make it happen that I was going to say no to it so I went to Iowa City and uh, my first game I got a little bit of uh, a little epic doomy action up against striker 2 and I know if Zosha's out there, she's listening and going, yay, striker two, and all that kind of stuff, because she's a swan and all that kind of crap. But anyway, uh, so I had, I was doing a pretty good job, I thought. I was killing a lot of dudes. Uh, he was, I was, I, I guess I didn't do a good job of necessarily putting my models in the best position from a scenario standpoint, because I, he was able to pretty much dictate where my, because, you know, it's an e-doomy list, so it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of beasts in it and stuff like that, a lot of heavy war beasts. And he was able to dictate where they were going to go. But it turned out he he did a great job, especially on the feet turn, of really doing some great attrition on me. And I lost my mauler, and I lost my axer, and I lost uh, both uh, Iron Strike and his uh, and his uh, Slag Troll. And so I was I was really up against the wall. But I was down to uh, old Epic Doom Shaper. And I had Mulg left, but Mulg was out of his control area, and he really wasn't going to get into the game again. So I said, "Well, you know, we got time. We got uh, it's man mode time for the old man, because I can identify with old Doom Shaper, you know, because he's an old man, and uh, I just he's got powerful. He's got uh, the thing where you pay a pay a focus and you get boosted attack and damage. So powerful I, attack, yeah. yeah, powerful attack. And I went in there and I came up, I think, like two short." of killing him yeah uh, but uh see that's just the thing i mean you know you think about going with doom shaper too i mean you don't expect to see him kind of necessarily getting into the fray so to speak but uh 
you know, I could have, I, after I lost all those, those beasts, I could have easily just sort of, you know, thrown up my hands and said, well, this game's over with and stuff like that, but you got to keep plugging. And, and I almost ended up almost winning the game. So, yeah, especially on Striker, because he can, he can threat from forever. Uh, yes, he can, as a matter of fact. But um, so that that was my first game. I only played two games, but that was my first one. What about you, John? What about, what about your second game? Well, my second pair of games, I played uh, Ossian versus Gristle One on Friday night, and Ossian versus uh, Fjord Two Saturday morning. Okay. And uh, I changed up my Ossian list, and that's actually sort of my deep thought: is keep an eye on uh, on how your list deploys and stuff to see if maybe you need to change it up to maybe put an advanced deployment unit in. There so you go. I'd I'd found that the halberdiers, having the halberdiers and the invictors with everything else in the list was cluttering up my deployment zone. I wasn't being able to spread out like I want. Well, oh, that's an interesting thought. And against any high pow AOEs were like Mage Storm or uh, Resnick 2's feet, stuff like that, um, or like Siege and an Explosivo on stuff, uh, I found having two units to bunch up was starting to become a little bit of a liability. Okay. So I uh, threw a curveball. I uh, dropped Ilara, her Banshee, uh, the Rifleman, the Thane, and the Halberdiers. And I put in, like, Ianna and Holt, Eris 3. Uh, I'm sorry, Eris, yeah, Eris 3 with the Infiltrators, Max Infiltrators. Yeah, er and Eris. And I put it, in a... Uh, f funny fact, John, the uh, Eris 3, yeah, the Infiltrators are actually a unit attachment to Eris 3. It's a little known fact. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> and uh, and I also uh, rounded out with putting a, uh, a a cricket in a space cricket. Nice. Um, and uh, you know it's one of the things you look at your list, see how it deploys. Sometimes you've got to get the AD unit in just to unclutter your deployment zone to let you project force where you want it to be. That that's really an and interesting then, uh, thought, the, John, because I've never thought about doing that. You know, I always I guess I, I I look at my list and try to think about where the different models, what what capabilities they're bringing to the table, but. Their, their impact upon the deployment zone was something I'd never considered before. Yeah, it, it really, when you start putting heavy infantry numbers on the table, you start realizing, man, that's taking up a lot of space. True that. So, tried that out, and I enjoyed it. I mean, the first game against Gristle won the, Vic, the uh, infiltrators. <laughs> they just charged forever. I mean, I had him barely out of his deployment zone, Titan infiltrators. Nice. And if it hadn't been Gristle One and her being able to feed and uh, hoof it up the board, she would not have been able to get much going at all. Yeah, I mean, if she doesn't feed that, she's she's going to be locked way deep in her deployment zone. Yeah. God, in, you're making me want to haul up my my uh, angry elves. You know that. Uh oh. <laughs> that one. Nah. Then, so, then I look at my trolls and I go, ah, trolls, and that's all I need to do. Uh, another one from from that particular game was uh, deciding you have to make a decision at some point as things are starting to not go your way, uh, and decide what you want to attrition. Because uh, Brian, my opponent, was left with this unenviable thing of having he had a, a earthborn with like a handful of boxes left, mm -hmm. and he was going to be fully functional because he had a he had a whelp there. He knew he was going to be fine, but. I had to decide if you wanted to try and kill my heavy jack and then die to the Invictors or kill, like, the Invictors and maybe Ayana and maybe the rest of his army can deal with the heavy jack later because he had a slag troll in there. Yeah. So at that point, he actually chose to kill the Invictors because he'd get the eat off of them, so maybe I get luck unlucky, roll some bad dice, and don't kill his Earthborn. Yep. Snacking is now my favorite ability in the game. So I feel like he chose wisely. It worked pretty well for him. Um, I still ended up killing the Earthborn. Um, and uh, Little uh, Mittens, the solo, the Magister solo. Yes. He is my new favorite solo. <laughs> oh, my God. What did, he, what, did, what did he do for you? Well, he went up and he, he combo smited a, uh, an Axer far away and crushed his spirit, literally. <laughs> And then uh, he followed that up by delivering the finishing blow to Gristle because I hit her with Ossian's gun and I did like so much damage that it would kill her or make a tough roll, 
where she could transfer it to either one of her two beasts, but she'd take blowback regardless. Oh, wow. So that's another thing is you have to look at, at the whole game. He had a choice. He could either kill his Axer, who was much more wounded, and take seven points of blowback, or kill his Bouncer, who was feeling a bit better, and only take two points of blowback. Got to kill the healthy one. He, he didn't. He killed the... He killed the Axer because he was looking at having a game, you know, trying to keep himself in the game, trying to keep his options open. Yeah. Which I can't argue with. You know, he made the choice. I'm not saying it's the best choice, but. And and the act keep keeping the Axer's uh, rush animus on the table is a big deal too. At that point, rush wasn't going to matter. He was going to get suppose. where he needed to get. He was yeah. al- he was already so, in in fully engaged at that point. Yep, and so he ended up dying. She he ended up dying to the Magister. And then uh, the other quick point from the other game, so you got time to talk about your other game, mm-hmm. is uh, even though I guess we're a little behind schedule, um, yeah, whatever. was if if a shot's important enough, like an Ossian's feature, and I feed it to take the Judicator off the table, uh, I did not. I left it with a handful of boxes. Uh, luckily, things went my way, and it didn't get to do much work anyways. But um, when I shot it with Ossian's gun, I had enough focus uh, to boost it or boost damage, I went greedy and tried to boost damage and ended up rolling the snake eyes to miss. Wow. Sometimes when you're going to put enough force into something, sometimes just hitting, especially when you're doing an extra night of damage like that, sometimes it's worth it just to guarantee the hit. I know it's only 1 in 36, but no damage, if you feel no damage, could be the killer. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's 1 in 36, but then you put the extra die on it and it goes to 1 in 256. So, yeah, two sixteen, whichever it is. But yeah, yeah. But, I don't yeah. Remember. So that was my thought there, because uh, I ended up leaving it with a few enough boxes that I feel like a Hal thirteen would have gotten him dead. Granted, I was out of position too, and that's another good thing. If you see a colossal and your plan is to kill it really, really quick, think about where you're deploying your guys. Yep. Um, it's another thing. That's one of the few things with the invictors. I spread the invictors out to not. Um, to not clutter up for the Judicator's auto-fire because it's bonded to Fiora. Yep. Um, and I probably should have actually put Quicken on them to get them further up the board first turn from doing that. Um, but I was so enamored with Quickening the Cricket to get it up the board a good ways, and then not realizing, like, look, it's going to have 16-inch range. It's got plenty of range. True. I don't necessarily think I need that. So think about that stuff. It's little things you can learn through play. And there's a couple times I noticed in games where he was going to get uh, one or two, one of my two opponents was going to get to take shots at me, and I didn't place them in the best spot. Like I didn't place them right next to the wall, I didn't place them right next, you know, towing in the forest, stuff like that. So keep an eye on your positioning. Little things like that could make all the difference in the world. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. You know, it, it really is a game that that really rewards excellent positioning. And sometimes, you know, you may not think you need that extra little plus two, but boy, sometimes it can make all the difference in the whole wide world. Yep. And you can look at it from both ways. It's how far up the table you get. Uh, I ended up putting two infiltrators a little too far up the table, so the adjudicator got to barely get a spray on them both on on his turn. So if I hadn't done that, I'd have two more infiltrators, and I probably would have killed that uh, adjudicator and no second round of attacks. God, is there a worse feeling in the world than when you go, ah, crap, I just went too... And, you know, it's not something I've... In most of my factions, I've ever had to worry too much about because usually the stuff I play is slower than molasses in January. <laughs> but, uh, God, you know, it get, when it gets to... to When you move yourself forward like that and you, and you just get... You do it wrong by just a fraction of an inch, and then, boom, things are dead. That's how this, that's yep. how this game is. Yep, it is. So, but uh, I ended up pulling that one out on scenario. I ended up taking the zone on one side of the table, putting Ossian into it, scoring two. On his turn, he had nothing to get in. Like uh, his only bet was if he had his Arcanist go forward and try and kill one particular major infiltrator with its spell while in melee with it, and it worked in the middle of the wreck marker. As you see wow. how hard this is getting as I go down the road line there then he might have been able to run one of his choir members through part of the rec marker into the zone to make it a longer game. Wow. Yeah, no. But he looked at it, he looked at it and said, 
I can't get anything in the zone. You're, even if I do, you're just going to blow up the objective, kill what I put in the zone, and score five anyways. So let's just re-rack and let me play someone else. There you go. And he's a newer guy just starting to get back into it. I'm like, thumbs up. GG, baby. Yep, so there you go. It's four in a row wins for uh, the uh, Ratcasters. Doing pretty good with them. Nice. Um, I am. I my second game was with a list. I'm. I feel a, a little bit more confident with. It's a uh, variation of a, of a list that uh, Brett Painter did for me. Uh, it's uh, an Emadrac list, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's got the Tuffalos in it and stuff like that. And I have yet to lose with the list, and I'm pretty happy with it. So it is. Uh, I was playing up against Helga, which is a. Uh, one of the new casters that came out just recently was released at uh, Gen Con, and uh, the fellow that was playing it uh, asked the TO if it'd be okay if he played Helga, and I, I was like, I got no problem with that. And uh, so we played some Helga, and he made he made a few mistakes. He uh, he when he feeded, he didn't use the the smite as much as he wanted to, as he probably should have. I think like one of the first models that he activated and was going to use the smite from the feet. Uh, on he decided he didn't want to and he didn't really come back to it so much and that probably would have made a difference at the end of the game uh, it was it was a situation where I was able to use my Tuffalos and uh, and uh, Horthal to get over there and uh, it was the the two circles I think it's uh, outflank outflank yeah. yeah and uh, he I was able to kind of bully him out of that zone and I was able to keep on putting enough other stuff in the other zone so that I was able to dominate it a couple of times and ended up winning. So uh, I don't know if I necessarily have a whole lot of thoughts out of that one other than I'm pretty happy with that list, and I think it's going to be my, one of my two drops. My e Doom Shaper list is, I think, a little bit more of a work in progress. I was kind of playing a little bit of jank with uh, putting the Slag Troll in there, being run by... Um, Horgle, and I'm not so sure I'm convinced that's exactly the right place for Horgle. Uh, I got uh, I was talking to Kurt Hinman uh, today mm -hmm. a little bit on the uh, on the Facebooks, and uh, we got we got to have Kurt on the show because we've been talking about having him on the show. And Maybe after WTC, so we can talk about his experiences there. He actually wants to come on before the the WTC, so that people know who the hell he is. Um, well, there you go. We can do that too. Yep. So uh, we got to get him on and. Uh, so we'll, we will, and he uh, he gave me some advice on an edit for it, where I'm going to put in uh, some some Creel warriors, and I'll tell you what I'm looking at those guys and I'm going why haven't I not, why have I not built a list with these clowns before, because they're sort of awesome, and so yep, they're going to take I'm going to have them with the unit with the UA and uh, a caber thrower in there as well. And t that'll take the place of the slag and hor and horgal, and uh, I think that there's one other point in there that I get rid of too. So, but it should be a good time. I uh, will hopefully be playing that on Tuesday, and I'll be able to do a little bit of an update on that one. And that is kind of the list I like this week, which is this. Uh, it, it would be Doom Shaper two with a with a Mauler, uh, an Earthborn, a. Uh, so let's see, a Mauler Earthborn Mulg, an Axer, the Rune Bearer, and then we have uh, a full set of Creole Warriors, 10 of them, with the UA and uh, the and one Caber Thrower. And then I have also on uh, in there I've got a uh, small Creole Stone with the, uh, Creole, with the uh, UA on that one as well. So that's a list I think I like, and uh, I already like the Doom Shaper version I've got already. So I, and I think it's just going to be strictly better with the with the Creel Warriors in there. So here's to Kurt Hinman. The the I'm calling the, the list Project Springfield. So <laughs> hey, Ron. Ron. So um, just so the brush heads know, one last little thing here before we head off into flippity bloops is that we will be having the triumphant return of Brunch Machine coming to a theater near you in uh, September 6th. We uh, The hiatus will be over with. I've been I gotten through the cons. I'm going up to Rydia Fan's wedding in uh, in Madison, and so that would normally be the time that we would have the uh, the 
the old uh, brunch machine. So we are not going to be doing that. I'm going to be celebrating with uh, him, and and it'll be good times. And then Belinda, the librarian, and I are going up to uh, the Minneapolis St. Paul to visit some of her friends from when she lived up there. So it's going to be great times. And then uh, we'll be back to the brunch machine starting on September the 6th. Excellent. So why don't we get to that uh, that section of the show that we all love so much. Uh, some people might call it doopity flips, or they might call them ippity dupes, or they might call it zappity grumble. But we would never call it zappity grumble because that's just dumb. Uh, so yeah, really. We call it flippity bloop. Hey, hey, Ron. Ron. Mm. I had to bust out the flask for that one. So well, the first one I've got here is from Declan Lowry. Ah, uh, yeah. He says... Well, now, John, you've been challenged. Will you complete your challenge? You have 24 hours. As a, ma- as a matter of fact, I have completed the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. And if you go to the Painting with Menoth John uh, Facebook page, you will see a video of myself and Belinda Librarian dumping ourselves with ice water because we're all in favor of it. So I'm, I'm also going to, I know that, I know that you're only, if you, you can either donate or you can dump yourself with water. I'm going to do both. I'm going to donate and dump water because ALS, I'm all, I'm all about cancer getting wiped out because cancer sucks. And I disapprove of people's uh, bodies rebelling against them. And also I'm going, to be don- so I'm going to be donating to ALS, but I'm also going to be donating to uh, the Atlanta Boxer Rescue, which is one of my favorite charities. Uh, I'm all about the little bosses. We all know that Zaza the Bossa, the incredible Bossa, is uh, one of the, is the one of the two animal mascots along with Crash the Bird, which you heard earlier on this show, uh, and uh, so get out there, folks. I, I challenged some people. I named some people off in the videos that had already uh, had already done the challenge, so I had to kind of regroup there a little bit. But uh, I would encourage each and every one of you out there to get out and donate to ALS. It's a terrible damn disease, and it's got we got to wipe it out. So there you go. And you, you got challenged too, didn't you, John? Yeah, you challenged me. I'd gotten challenged before, but my wife and I have already donated. And since I don't have an easy way of doing a cool video dumping myself, uh, you know, I won't. But uh, if I can get uh, not Brushhead Joe to get his gear out, and maybe uh, I'll do one in front of a drop zone uh, sometime this week if I can do that just for fun. If any of you are good with computer graphics and want to make one of John. Uh, as a computer-generated character, getting dumped with ice water, that would work too. So there you go. <laughs> Post that to the Facebook page. I can just put my face on top of somebody else's. It'll be hilarious. That'd be super awesome. <laughs> All right. So our second one okay. is from Thomas Ranshaw, who okay. says, an immovable object or irresistible force? I'm all about the irresistible force. I think I've always been more drawn to the uh, the concept of the irresistible force, uh, much like a tornado, um, uh, or something akin to that. I, I'm I'm of that ilk to go that direction. What about you, John? Are you more of an irresistible force kind of guy or an immovable object kind of guy? I'm more of an immovable object kind of guy. Okay. You know, as the the 300 pound short guy uh, with big legs, stocky frame. Uh, I'm more the people bounce off me type of guy, so there you go. That's how I tend. <laughs> there you go. Good. That I. I. That sounds like a fine thing. Flippity bloop. All right. Well, Mike Bond uh, gives us two again: a trolley and a slightly less trolley. His trolling one is: What is your favorite piece of General Mills breakfast cereal? Oh, without question, Cinnamon Toast Crunch is the best cereal they make. I mean, without without question, it's the best thing they make. It is. And I'll tell you what, folks, I, I'm, I'm very sorry for y'all because you will never taste Cinnamon Toast Crunch as good as it can be because unless you work for the company. Because Cinnamon Toast Crunch, when it's coming off of the machine that puts that sugar and spice on the surface of it, is it's a religious experience. Also, <laughs> also, there's a couple of other products you'll never taste that are also pretty amazing. And one of them is uh, Fruit by the Foot. Before it is actually rolled out and dried, it, when it's kind of kind of gooey and like it's it's like fruit plastic, it's amazing. <laughs> and it turns out that I was at this tournament I was at uh, 
uh, Mr. White, what, the gentleman I played who played uh, with Helga, uh, also worked for General Mills at one time. And he worked in the Fruit by the Foot department. So shout out to Mr. Uh, Mr. Dan White. So uh, he, Because Cedar Rapids is just a little ways away from Idaho, from Iowa City. So it, he was, I believe, from Cedar Rapids. So super cool. So that those those two are amazing. Also, golden grams before they put before they toast it, uh, it and it's still high moisture and, and lovely is pretty amazing as well. So flippity bloop. Oh, that's uh that's General Mills golden grams. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's made but on the, the same. But I changed my answer. I yeah. was mentally answering uh, Honey Nut Cheerios because I love me some Honey Nut Cheerios. Yep. But golden grams is my shit. Oh yeah, golden gra- golden don't grams. Work is, anymore. Golden grams is amazing. Oh. So good. So, a little, a little, true story, a little inside fact: Golden Grams has the most amount of sugar in the cereal itself of any of our uh, any of the cereals that they make. So, you know, not on the surface, down deep where you where it counts is where the sugar is, and that's probably why it's so good. I hope I didn't violate any agreements by telling you that. I probably did. Anyway, so flippity boop. All right. Well, the next one is uh, his lately less trolley one, which is thoughts on the new Signar Jack teaser from Scars of Cain. I hope it has a button on it in the on the model that makes the little things flip out. So I'm it's like it's got kung fu grip. So it, I don't think it will because in the picture they showed like a little the 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 things like spread apart and then together, and I thought that was pretty nifty, but uh, it probably won't have kung fu grip. Now, uh, as for the model itself, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a fan. I think it looks I think it looks like they went to the parts bin and said, "Well, shit, we got all these like leftover storm pod things from the uh from the Thunderhead and we have like I don't know, we've got these things over here from another model. It, it looks like they went to the the parts bin and made a model out of it." So, I'm I'm just not a fan. Also, Signar. Boom. What about you, John? What's your feelings on it? Um, eh. I don't play Signar anymore. Looks okay. It, uh, it's kind of interesting. It kind of gives me the theory that maybe they'll make uh, the War Jacks of Renown, as they're called, or were called, uh, into three Jack kits. And other than that, you know, whatevs. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that it's it's one of those things where it's going to be on the Stormclad chassis, and and then they're making the 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 Jack. I also have a theory is that none of them will release that this none of the ones from Exigence will not Exigence but uh Vengeance will release until these set releases so they can set them, send them as a 3 jack kit. Oh yeah yeah it'll be like when that book's on the horizon and they're the early release for the book like oh look yeah. Yep. That's what's going to be. They're not dumb. No. So there you go flippity bloop. All right, Charles Collins asks uh, an interest, uh, interesting quick one. Which Warlock from Exigence is funnest to play and why? From Exigence? So that's the Horde's book. Yes. Um, yep. I think that I, I, I'm a little jealous of the Scorn guys. I think Xerxes 2 is going to be a party because I hear that when you put uh, mobility into a faction that has a uh, lightning strike as an animus, that, that you're talking all kinds of shenanigans, and uh, so I think I think and plus plus Rhino can't be bad, and uh, so that I think that's a going to be very legitimate. I have to I have to tell you though I am looking forward to Berica. I think that some <laughs> some of some of the lists that I've seen come around now with Rock and three or four Axers. And Creel Warriors, at, you know, once again, this is a Chad Schonkweiler list, and apparently he's he's troll Jesus. Um, he uh, that it just looks like a, a ton of fun that you're going to be able to get in there and um, freeze a bunch of stuff, and then your Creel Warriors are going to be standing there after they got killed, st- still standing, going, "What up, dog?" And it's going to be good times. So, I think Barricka could be a lot of fun. I, I really think. To, I'll, I'll be honest with you, John. I think all of the casters for, that they've talked about are all super fun looking to to run. I mean, who doesn't want to run uh, Zap Bradigus with all the wolves? Wolves are cool. 
and having a yeah. having a spell that you can spam with with uh, geomancy that gives rough terrain. Man, I'm not glad I'm not playing Protectorate right now because they hate some they hate some some rough terrain. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> and uh, so th- they I, do. I think that. Uh, that, that that's my take on it, at least. What do you what do you think, buddy? What which ones do you think are going to be the most fun? Uh, I actually think that Helga is going to be most fun hands down because that feet turn is going to be hilarious fun. Man, I'm going to tell you what. There are Just certain lists. Slamming stuff everywhere. There, there, <laughs> there are there are some lists that are going to hit, see that feet hit them, and they're going to be like, "Holy cow! Hang on, baby." <laughs> yep, I think it's just going to be fun. Uh, I, I'm kind of looking forward to uh, the squid to get some play with that, see how he does with it. Frankly, anything that makes the, the Minions players happy, I'm kind of okay with. They suffered an awfully long time. Absolutely. So, there you go. Flippity bloop. All right, next one's from Daniel Riker, who I feel like I should know, but I don't. He's he the... says, do you guys think Xerxes 2 is playable? Um, first off, Dan- Daniel Riker's the short guy from Dark Omen Gaming Club. So he's the short one. He's not Anthony. He's uh, but he's super cool. I, I'm just trolling him by calling him short. He's not, he's not one of the guys on the podcast. So I've Mm-mm. I've only met a couple of those guys. No, I met Daniel at uh, at TempleCon and at, yeah, TempleCon, and he's a really wonderful fella. And I told him I wanted to have him on the on the show too, because he's hey, that's part two. He says, "When are you guys gonna let me on the show?" Yeah, and I'm gonna let you on, and if if you don't, if, as long as you stop asking me, and then yeah, I'll take it over, man. Yeah. <laughs> um but yes we we will definitely have you on the show buddy. The um so is, is Xerxes too legit? I think he is. I mean, I've seen some I've watched some games on uh, Chain Attack TV with Trevor uh playing him and he's he's proxying him with a uh with a kind of just a large base and Xerxes in his Xerxes model taped to the uh to the base. I don't think that's the right way to proxy him, by the way. I just want to go out on, on record as saying that is not the correct proxy for Xerxes. The correct proxy for Xerxes, and I'm going to get in all kinds of trouble for this, is something that the, I'm, going to, I'm going to throw the Muse on Minis guy underneath the bus on this one. They think that the most perfect one is to take uh, a Superman doll and tape it to the ta- tape it to a uh, a rhino. So you go out and you get one of those rhinos uh, from like a, a hobby store or something, and you tape Christopher Reeve essentially, on top of the rhino because he, it's, a, it's a wheelchair, right? The rhino's uh, a yeah. wheelchair. So that's, that's very offensive, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's... What, I want to say, state for the record, that's what Muse on Minis said. So if you find that offensive, don't blame me. It's blame it on Muse on Minis. And if you think it's hilarious, it's me. It's 100% me. So, But, uh, I, you know, I saw, I saw him playing it. It looks like a lot of fun. Ignite casters are always fun, and the uh, the the feat that he has, where everybody's in his control area, and you know that there's that just opens up to all manners of shenanigans. I think battle cats are actually going to be kind of fun with him. I'm not hearing a lot of a lot of talk about the battle cats, but I think that battle cats ranging out on the outside and then being able to do their thing on his feet turn. It, signs importance on battle cats coming at your caster from every direction seems bad. Seems like a really bad idea. Yeah. So, what do you think? What do you think, John? What's your take on old Xerxes too? Uh, I feel like he's gonna be playable. I think you're gonna see him. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on him yet. I, I try not to judge too much. Till I see him on the table or or hear some good battle reports. But yeah, he seems good. I mean, he's got good tools. And he looks like he'll be fun. Cavalry casters are just fun. I don't know what it is. Just fun. I think he's probably... I think... I'm going to say it right now. This is a, a bold statement. And that's what we, what we like here on Painting with Men Off, John, is bold statements. I think he's going to turn out to be the best battle engine caster of, of any released so far. That's not exactly a bold statement. That's <laughs> kind of called hedging your bets pretty well. <laughs> Shh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Bold statement, John. Bold statement. Oh, yeah. Out on the rim. Out on the limb. Uh, so there hilarious. you go. Flippity bloop. And and Dan will have you on soon because I want to talk about all the good work you guys do at uh, at Dark Omen for charity especially. I'm there. Absolutely. I mean, you want to talk about a club that does it right. 
and does right by and brings a good name to the War Machine community. It's the Dark Omen guys, in spite of the fact that they made a beer called Fap and Nap. Indeed. In, in, in spite of that, they're still great guys. Also, that beer was legit. It was completely wonderful. I had some. And I, I did neither of the namesakes, as far as anyone can tell. So there you go. Flippity bloop. All right, Scott, have a sec, and I have a quick uh, funny one. Who would be the worst two people to be shackled between on a chain gang? So I'm going to assume that he's talking from the Iron Kingdoms. Because, you know... I figured that as well. Char- Charles Manson and, uh, let's say, Hitler would probably be the two worst, like, of all time. There. Now we're on the Internet. Well, I would, now, at that, now we're on the at, Internet. At that point, I'd probably just... I'd probably just try and pull a double Princess Leia and choke them both to death at the same time. Nice. Um, Get that chain around next and just go. So, so I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that's not what we're talking about. That we're actually talking about the uh, that we're talking about from the IK. And I'm going to guess that um, in the back of the chain gang, I don't want Jarrah Crow because he's got backstab. And that seems like a natural yeah. place for him. And I don't want him anywhere near the backstab area. Uh, and in front of me, I don't want any protectorate caster because they, they tend to throw their people out in front of them and then they die. So I'm going to say those two guys. I'll say, um, I'll say Vindictus. No, oh, Vindictus. Yeah, because he's going he's gonna to he's gonna say, hey, dude, Sackpon, take it. And uh, then you know, then then we've had it. So, what about you, buddy? What are you, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm thinking for for the escaping portion. He said working or escaping. I'm gonna guess say, Maylock because he's undead and he stinks, and God, that would suck. Yeah. And uh, well, Patty McButterpants because Prashet is huge, and I don't have to drag all his dead weight around. Can you imagine the smell coming off of the nether regions of that one? No, I can't, and that's probably a good thing. Probably smells better. I mean, you probably roll up on a Titan and go, "Wow, you smell like perfume." Yeah. So that's that's what I came up with. Yeah, I like I like it. I, legit, I give it a I give that the seal of approval on that one. Flippity bloop. All right. Well, Joseph Pachuga uh, asks two here real quick. Will hordes people ever be real people? And should we an, ex- an expectation of theme forces be that they are competitive? Okay, so hordes people. I'm I'm a little bit confused by this, as I sit here and paint it, my. It's dozen. a mom joke. Oh, it is. So yeah, so I forget who it is. Someone's like talks how they're not real people. I, you know, it's it's one of those jokes that apparently is catching on. Unfortunately, sounds like um, sounds like I didn't find it terribly funny. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hordes is legit. I'm really enjoying it. So yes, hordes people. Are real people too, and sometimes even if your name is Menoth John, you got to play the hordes. So, I, I think absolutely. Uh, as for the second half of the question, which is, do theme forces need to be competitive? I think they need to be competitive in order to get played, because uh, nobody likes walking down to the LGS and putting all your models out on the table and getting your butt kicked. However, I you know I, here's one thing I will say is that I think a that the days of having to get three units of X or four units of X in order to get into a theme force, thankfully, appear to be over. Uh, maybe runes, yeah. of, maybe runes of war is the last time we're ever going to see that. Well, that you don't even have to. You can have the two and just go with other stuff. You just get more bonus for having more. I think that's what we're going to see going forward. True. It's yeah. more more bonuses for going crazy, but not necessary. I, I mean, I, I hearken back to when I was playing Protectorate. Uh, not Protectorate, but uh, Retribution. And I would, you know, you, you have those silly, you need four units of Mage Hunter Strike Force. And I'll tell you what, putting together and painting four units of Mage Hunter Strike Force is 0% fun. And the Mage Hunter Infiltrators were almost enough to cause me to have a th- have a stroke. So... I, I, yeah, no. Maybe if I got Ashton to paint them. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that after I said, yeah, I want you to paint three units of, of Mage Hunter Strike Force, Ashton would go, you don't have enough money for that. 
That, that, by the way, is going down as one of my favorite lines of all time. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't have enough money for that, and I don't care how much money yep. you have. So, um, and I would say that it shouldn't be expected that they be super competitive, but yep. they should be in the ballpark. Yeah, I mean, they they should bring enough benefits to it to make to to balance out some of the negatives that you're bringing to the party. You know, and usually that b- balances out by points advantage, where you, you're you're getting some kind of a break in points, and therefore you end up with uh, not not suffering so much as a result of it. You know, Dozer and Smig here is kind of coming along. I'm kind of happy with how things are turning out. Yeah, hey, it's looking good. I, I went with a green cannon because I thought that, well, you know, they're going to, they, it is stolen off of a red Kadoran jack, but there, there are green Kadoran jacks too. There's like that alternate scheme that you always see sometimes that is pretty sweet. And so oh, I, yeah. and, and I said, well, and I used Gnarls green. So Gnarls, you know, that's kind of a trollish color. So I decided to go with the Gnarls green. So. Flippity bloop. All right. Uh, Marth Fright asks, what complements a three-grain porridge best, apple, pear, or banana? Wow, porridge, huh? Now, is that like oatmeal? Yeah. Is that like oatmeal? Sure. Okay. No earthly idea, to be honest. Yeah, we don't have porridge here in the States. Um, we have oatmeal, and we have, like, cream of wheat and stuff. So I'm gonna. my first assumption is that it's like oatmeal, and bananas and oatmeal is legit. So I would say probably bananas are good. Strawberries are also good. Um, the if it is cream of wheat, honestly, if it's if it's like a cream of wheat kind of thing, there there really is only one thing to put in cream of wheat, and that's maple syrup and brown sugar. So I don't know about what porridges are like there in Germany, uh, but uh, I would say probably bananas if it is an oatmeal type thing. Or brown sugar and maple syrup, not one of your not one of your options. What about what do you think, John? I'm gonna put you on the spot. How how do you like your uh, porridge? Yeah. I am yeah. going to uh it is like oatmeal. I'm gonna say apple because it adds a good texture uh, to oppose the porridge. You know, this is why That's this as much thought as you're gonna get from me in there. You know, this is exactly <laughs> why this show is so well known for its high its its war machine tech content. Is that we're answering <laughs> questions on how to make your porridge. porridge taste good? Yep. So, yeehaw. We got we got time for one more. Oh, uh, we got a ton more. So if we can go a little extra and get a couple more, I'd All like right. to. Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. Let's see if we can get a couple quick ones. Um, Joseph Merrick for a quick one asks: Did you visit the whiskey golem at the weird miniature booth at Gen Con? No, I did not. I uh, I did not. I, I walked past the weird miniature booth. So let me talk a little bit about my, I may have mentioned on the last show, but my experience at Gen Con was all of about nine hours, and all of it was spent playing War Machine. I went to the, when I when I went to the, to the booth, to the uh, vendor hall, I went exactly long enough to go, do you have a Monsternomicon? And they, and Aaron, and uh, I was talking to Ed Burrell, and uh, to uh, Mike Plummer, and they said, no, those things, those things sold out on Thursday. And then I said, okay, well, um, do you have a Berica? And they said, oh, yeah, we got lots of Bericas. And then I realized that Jay's sending me a Berica, and so I didn't get a Berica. But I did get the uh, Night of the Noxious Dead expansion for the Zombies Go Home game, and I am looking forward to playing that, I have to tell you. That game's legit. That is sweet. That game is legit. And it so, sounds sweet. Yep. And it's a lot of fun. So I think that uh, Signar Jake and I, or I don't know if I should even call him Signar Jake anymore. If he, when, he, when he rolls another pair of dice, he can get his name back. Um, but until <laughs> then, he's just Jake. So I know he really likes it. And uh, Troll Chuck, he really likes it. So we'll probably, and Belinda Librarian likes it. So we'll probably play it a little bit here probably in the next couple of days. But it is a legit game. And then you add on top of it these stinker zombies. And it's gonna be super fun. So, did I answer the question? No, I did not see Whiskey Chick at uh, at Weird Miniatures whiskey because it's, it's I don't Malifo. I don't have any time for Malifo. Nobody in our local meta plays it. Uh, it is I I I looked at the card one time when I had some I I bought some Malifo models and and bought the book and stuff and I liked the fluff. And I looked at the cards. This is the first edition game, and it made me want to go blind. 
from reading the cards. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sure there's a good game in there somewhere, but I don't know where it is. So I didn't I didn't move any forward with it. What about you, John? Did you see the did you go to the weird miniature booth when you didn't go to Gen Con? Nope, but I saw I saw the whiskey golem on Twitter. Yep. That's about the size of that. There you go. Flippy blue. All right. All right, here's one for Richard Johnson. I have the perfect answer for. Okay. And just just bear with me here. It's kind of crazy. Yep. Flippity bloop. Bloop flippity. Flippity bloop bloop. Flip 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 bloop flop flip. Flippity bloop McFlip flop. The correct answer is I am Groot. Damn it, you took it away from me. <laughs> That's absolutely what I was going to say. <laughs> That's the answer. That is the only answer. I am Groot. <laughs> exactly. Oh. I am Groot? Yeah. <laughs> Flippity Groot. Oh. Flippity Groot. Uh, uh, Brett Painter asks, uh, will the new doctor be less annoying? I don't know, but I'll let you know tomorrow. Um, I'm going to, uh, Belinda and I have tickets to go watch the episode, uh, the first episode at the movie theater on uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Super excited that's, to see it. That's legit. Yep. You know, we figured, what the heck? I mean, you only get a new doctor every now and again, and so we decided to to go ahead and, and see it at the movie theater. Seems like it would be a fun time. Yeah. Kind of like a social um, well, thing. I, I will counter with, I did not find the last doctor annoying at all. In fact, I found he had some really, really good moments. Maybe not as good as David Tennant, but his his peaks were very high indeed. Yeah, Bell and I were talking about this at dinner tonight, and... I like I like Matt Smith more than she does, and she misses um, what's his face, the first guy. Um, oh, I gotcha, uh, Christopher Eccleston. Yeah, he she misses him a lot. I think I think she likes him for different reasons than I would have liked him, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but you know that's fine. And uh, yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing about d- different doctors is that you, you always have, you know, some people like some of them, some people like different ones. That's okay. But I'm looking forward. I'm I'm really looking forward to Peter Capaldi. I think he'll be. I think he'll do a fine job. I'm looking forward to seeing where, uh, you know, so long as we don't have another 54 episodes of Daleks, I think I'll be pretty happy. Yeah. Kind of done with Daleks. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I still have a half season to catch up on with the wife, which will start soon. Yep. But uh, we like having a bunch in a row, so we can just sit down and watch it. I hear you. I hear you absolutely on that one. Flippity bloop. All right. Um. Some quick silly ones. Uh, Ashton, asked, Ashton asked us two, the sillier of which is which Scarlett Johansson, the island, Iron Man, or Avengers? Yes. Uh, All the Scarlett Johansons. I, I, I would say the Avengers because I like her hair in the Avengers better. It's bullshit. Um, you like the leather. But, uh, yeah, I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. But uh, I would actually say the answer is apparently called... Under the Skin, which is a movie that came out last year where she gets butt-ass naked. So uh, that's probably the right answer. So, yeah, that, she's, an, she's an attractive lass. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's funny. There, so many of those starlets don't appeal to me, like, even in, even a little. However, uh-huh. however, Scarlett Johansson. Va, 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 yeah. boom. Indeed. All right. Uh... James Halgren asks us, uh, why did you make your Facebook avatar so terrifying? I mean, it's just a wampa, man. It's not terrifying. It's me with a wampa hat. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. not terrifying. That's cool. Yeah. your hat. You, you, that, that's half of why you have this job as my co-host. That hat is uh, legit. Wampa hat. Wampa hat is legit. For the win. It's actually a little OP. And it's warm. That's important. Well, I mean. Warm is good. Absolutely. It's almost as hot. It would, the only thing that would be warmer would be a Tauntaun hat, but you'd have to keep on cutting it open. <laughs> Not while I'm drinking. And it wouldn't smell <laughs> good either. No. Uh, so, so let's so see any more. Here's, here's a painting pro tip real quickly. Paint from the, ins- oh. from the inside out. Because if you paint from the outside <laughs> in, because you got lazy and decided to paint something on the outside, you're just going to end up repainting the shit that's on the outside. Because you just painted it. Damn it. There. End pro tip. All right. So Ashton also asks... uh, Also, this model needs to come to an end pretty soon. This is like painting a freaking colossal. Well, he's got a lot of detail on him, and he's big. At least his fists are big. 
big son of a buck. The, fi- the fists are the easy part. Uh, Flippity bloop. <laughs> Ashton also asks, Spring that's guard, what she said. yes, no, why? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, what was that again? I was saying that's what she said. Um, yeah. Flame guard, yes, no, why? Okay, fi- yeah, flame guard, yes. First off, yes. Uh, the reason is that for four to six points, you get a, a unit that is 13-13 with shield wall. So they're tip- your typical, you know, blunt instrument tar pit unit. But they cause terror. They have reach. They cause automatic fire with the unit, unit attachment. They have set defense. And you're in a faction that has, has a defender's ward. So... Uh, against a charge, you can have them be defense 13, 15, 17, and then they have iron zeal as their as their mini feet, which gets them up to 13 shield walls up to 17, iron zeals up to 21. So 17, 21 against a charge for 10 points. That causes auto That's fire and terror. That's pretty good. That is why. Now, what are some good uses for them? A great use for them is Sevy One. Sevy One, I the, the you put them in a, a list, and you can even get away with using just a minimum unit, just a four-point unit, to use as a, a little shield that rotates around him and keeps bog trogs from charging him. And <laughs> that's a big deal sometimes. <laughs> and uh, the the bog trogs don't even necessarily do a very good job of of hitting him, so. It, I, I really, I think Temple Flame Guard are very good, and they give you a lot of utility for a very few number of points. They're fast in a, in a they're speed six in a faction full of speed four and speed five, and the way the privateers going about it, they may never give us another speed five jack as long as they live. And uh, so I think that having something you can you can throw out there that you don't necessarily mind if you lose for not many points and still has a lot of capability, I think is, is a, is a great unit. So I say yes, firmly to Temple Flame Guard. John, you probably don't have a take on this one, do you? Take them. They're good. I don't like them, which means they're good. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) If you can judge things by hatred, there's a good one. I mean, I think that they're a fine, I think they're a wonderful six, five, four to six unit with that unit attachment up to, you know, it becomes a six, uh, six eight, God, ten, not ten, six eight, jeez. Yeah. So yeah, de- for shit for eight de- for eight points, they're amazing. So there you go, flippy blue. All right. Um, let's see. Those two painting ones will probably take a while. I might have to get that on a different episode. Um, Patrick on Twitter goes, uh, "What other miniature games intrigue you, and why?" I think the one that intrigues me the most right now is Infinity. Um, it, it's I think that. If you look at miniature games that are being, that are going out right now, it's got a lot of support. Corvus Belly is putting out a lot of product and, and is supporting it quite heavily. He- heavily, excuse me. They, it's it's just starting a new rule set, which from yeah. everything I've heard uh, solves some of the more fiddly problems with the first rule set. Even though I'm not necessarily familiar with the first rule set, uh, the the Krug is a legit podcast and sister podcast to Painting with Menoth, John. And so there's there's good there's a good community around the game, which is so important. Uh, if yes. I if if I did not have a you know if if they if people played it, I even approached Zach from from Brunch Machine if and see if he had any interest whatsoever because I'd I'd go in on the two player kit, and uh, he didn't seem so interested because he's got enough other stuff to do and he's a busy guy too. Uh, so but yeah, Infinity would be my game that I don't have that intrigues me. And the models look pretty slick, too. Plus, I want to play a Scarface guy, because my friend John here says he's pretty cool. He's it's awesome. What about you, John? Oh, God, I really don't have games that intrigue me right now, because, I mean, I already have, like, five or six games I play. Yeah. I mean, I look like they've got Warzone in the store. I'm like, eh, whatevs. If we're playing a Firestorm Armada, I'm like, eh, whatevs. The closest would be your Star Wars Armada. Oh. <laughs> when that That's comes out. Happening. Yeah. That's gonna be awesome. I have I have X Wing already, and I'm I'm very interested to see when when Armada comes out because I think that's gonna be super fun. 
Who doesn't want to play? Who doesn't want to play with uh, star destroyers? Whoever it is, they're wrong, unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> Flippity bloop. All right. Well, one more I definitely want to get to. We can see after that. Uh, yep. Bonzi just asked, uh, "What game will you never play?" Forty K. <laughs> I will never play Forty K. I avoided it. I managed to miss it. Go back and play that game would be to um, would be to go back and make a mistake. Why would I want to do that? I keep on moving forward, folks, not backwards. I, okay, Forty K is probably a good game. Okay, and well, it's probably a pl- well. It's got the a new bucket. version actually apparently is playable. Yeah, the the new version, from what I've heard, you know, with the um, all those kind of weird random strategic objective cards and stuff. Yeah. See, to me, that seems to be appealing, but it, it doesn't seem also. It also doesn't seem to have a shred of of strategic value whatsoever. I mean, compared to War Machine, why would I want to go to, from a game that has a lot of strategic depth to one that is, oh, look, I pulled a card and scored two victory points. Yeah, exactly. It just, I, I can see that it, it would be fun. If I need to scratch my Space Marine itch, I just haul out Space Hulk. Exactly. And play a couple unbalanced games and and put it away. And I've already, I spent 100 bucks instead of, you know, 1000 bucks. Yeah. Also, I can tune into Mini Wargaming and watch 40K for free, and I don't have to own 60 bajillion dice and throw them on the table and then pick through for all the threes, fours, and fives or sixes, and then, oh, no. Thank you, no. There. So what, what about you, John? What game will you never play? I will say Wild West Exodus. Yep, I'll never play that and, one either. Uh, not just because it's done by Romeo Philippe, who makes a hell of a miniatures bag, but has other problems. Um, that's not even the reason. The reason is is that the people he hired treated uh, one of my buddies, the local press ganger, and occasional brush head, uh, seething Jenner, Tony Spike Lane. Uh, he actually treated him horribly. Like he got banned from his their forums for offering constructive criticism. Well, that'll happen. Dude, dude can't yeah, take a, so. dude can't take criticism with a shiznit. Yeah, but even constructive. So I mean, like I've read the whole things, looked through it all. And I'm like, that's that's BS. I would never ever support that game. Yep. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not telling anybody out there not to support it. But exactly, uh, support, support what you want to support. Yep. It's your but, life. But it uh, there's a reason that I find every possible way I can not to buy Battle Foam. I try. I, I that. I've got more battle foam than I want right now, and I I would if I was a new person buying a bag for the first time and I needed something, I would recommend KR Multi Case. Everything I've heard for, about those guys is that they are very customer centric. They produce a really nice product, and it seems like from for all intents and purposes, the 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 foam is very soft, and it should uh, protect. And with those hard cardboard boxes that they have. It should protect the minis quite well. So, and you, I don't think you can buy them at uh, Discount Games Incorporated. But if I said Discount Games Incorporated, that's almost like I'm doing a sponsorship thing. So I figured I'd go ahead and just Indeed. say it. Yep. So you might be able to get them, and I bet you if you ask Jay enough times, maybe he'd carry them. So there you go. Flippity bloop. All right, uh, I'll do a quick one here from uh, my boy Frank Thompson over in uh, the UK and the, in the Air Force, stuck there. Uh, he gave us two ones. Um, I got a couple painting ones here. Okay. I'll shout out you guys, uh, Christopher Taylor, Sassy Greyjoy, and Frank. We'll do your painting questions maybe another time when we have Ashton or we've got more time because they're more in depth. Sounds good. Take a bit longer. We had a ton this week. Um, but Frank asks, uh, "What do you two think of G- GW's sudden advancement to Warhammer Fantasy Battle storyline? Progress or WTF?" Uh, I would have no take on this whatsoever. I have not read any of their fluff. So, John, kick it over to you. Um, meh. I, I don't care about fantasy. Fantasy is a very broken game. I don't feel like playing for any seriousness. I mean, I would play with some buddies in a store. That's it. I haven't bought a fantasy book in two years. I mean, I don't even care, honestly. So did they did they advance the storyline or something? 
I guess they did. I, like I said, I don't even know. I, the last book I bought was the Orc and Goblin book. It came out before I started my current job, which is a while now. So, so, so what did they do? Yeah, it's like I can I imagine that advancing the storyline in that particular universe is chaos. Did some more chaosy things, and they... yeah, probably like hey, these special characters you know did cool stuff and then died, or did new cool stuff and are now different. You and know, now you can't play them anymore. So there's yeah, your I don't. So go take a poop on your hundred and fifty dollar model. Yeah, it's just not. Uh, well, that's a whole other story about special characters and UW. <laughs> I could go into that one for a while, but I just don't really care. I mean, their story is very. They have a very in-depth story and a very in-depth background, but I don't care about any of the people. I mean, I really never did. It was kind of cool to read, but it's like cool to read and like, oh, I happened. That happened. I don't really care. It's gonna. All, I mean, they do a story. It goes back to the status quo. That's sort of their thing. And then the rat guys attacked. Yes. Hey, them scravens are tight, yo. <laughs> so that's all Sorry, I got to say. It's an inside joke there. in our store. Yep. So, one more quick one, I think. Uh, that's uh, everything that's, else is I, painting or long tech. I think we're Benj, gonna... I will get your tech about how to kill Mage Hunter Strike Force later. Um, and then, uh, but AOEs. Mr. Baron asked, Ginger or Marianne? Oh, Marianne. I agree. Marianne, no I question about it. I thought we would disagree, it. but yeah. No, no no doubt about it. Ginger, whatever. Ginger's a high mean is pain in the butt. However, Marianne. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, Marianne's where it's at. Anybody, I'll and tell Mr. you what, Baron, other... any good God-fearing geek will, will tell you Marianne's where it's at. <laughs> she, 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 and you know what, it's just the clothes, too. Cause if, because if, if Marianne got all dialed up, she... I'll tell you what, that girl cleans up good. There's no two questions about that. So, flippity blue. All right, well, that's going to be it, because everything else, like I said, is a little more in-depth than we can get to right now. Yep, and that's, and, you know, we, we've been at this for quite, we'll our big one. We've been at this for quite some time, too, so it's probably a good time to wrap it up, and quite frankly, this, oh, my God, some of the places where you got to stick a brush on this model are enough to drive you into an apoplectic fit. Holy Christopher. <sighs> Also, by the way, um, I, this is the last model you will ever see me prime white. I don't care what I'm trying to paint. I will never prime white again. It's enough to make a fella drink, which is ironic because, hey, hey Ron. Hey, Ron. Mm. Mm. So I've got a movie to talk about, John. You just, uh, shockingly, I, I only do because I partially watched one. I didn't watch an entire movie, Brush Sheds. Not one. I it watched, was a heck of a week. I watched a whole damn movie. A whole damn oh, movie. Oh, lay it on me then. Because I was at, you know, I traveled all week. I'm, I'm in Seattle. By the way, for any of the brushes that, who are in the greater Seattle area, um, I'm going to be there every other week for the next literally two months. And um, so... I, if you can, if you get a hold of me, I'll bring some miniatures out and we'll play at probably Card Kingdom or something like that, or at uh, G3. But anyway, uh, the the movie I watched was a a computer generated anime called Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Harlock. Yep. <laughs> and uh, not Harlock. Not he's not uh, he's not a troll caster, um, but he it's it I really liked it. It's got a a, a very involved storyline. Go figure, for a, for an anime. Uh, it takes place that this guy Harlock is uh, somehow responsible. Well, I'm, I don't want to give away a bunch of spoilers, but uh, essentially, he's like this super badass pirate guy flying around in what appears to be a ship that was stolen from Warhammer 40k because it's got a skull on the front of it, and I mean it looks like something straight up out of uh, oh god was it was that. What was the name of the space game they had, John? It was... Uh... Battlefleet Gothic? Yeah, Battlefleet Gothic. This ship came straight up out of Battlefleet Gothic. And uh, they had... Uh... And uh, Harlock is somehow, and you'll learn about it in the movie, that he is uh, Im immortal. And he, they have to go and he's putting together ostensibly a series of 100 detonators that are going to reset some astral clock that is going to fix some problem with Earth. And that's the setup for the show. And uh, adventure ensues. 
and I had a great time with the movie. Uh, I thought it was really well done. You know, it was surprisingly for not being rated. Uh, it was almost no gore. Uh, the closest thing to sexy was the um, they did a scene with one of the, the the main female character where she's in the shower, but and she's like flipping through the air in zero g, taking a shower, but you never see anything. So I mean, this is something I could literally show my eleven year old. I think. And uh, it might be, you know, baby's first anime, so to speak. And uh, I was really impressed with it. Uh, the computer graphics were beautiful. The uh, art design was amazing. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, it, it's got that whole same thing that... Have you ever seen Appleseed, John? I have. Okay. It's kind and you're of, talking about the more recent one, I'm sure. Yeah. It, a- Appleseed has got kind of the same thing going on. And uh, so it's kind of like a different apple seed, which I I own apple seed. I really like it. Um, but uh, so I'm go- but it's got that kind of a thing going on. So I'm gonna say that it, I'm gonna give it a shot and a half of Kraken to kind of mm-hmm. get you in the right mood for it. Uh, but I really enjoyed the movie, and I it's on Netflix. Uh, it might be on Amazon. I'm not sure, but uh, it it's is not. it's really legit. So Space Pirate Captain Harlock. What do you got for me today, John? Uh, well, I'm going to talk about a movie I tried to watch. Um, <laughs> I won't go into details. I needed something funny, so I'm like, ah, I'll, I'll catch the Robin Williams Popeye movie because, you know, hey, I, I loved that movie when I was younger. Hi, oh, my Lord. Uh, I got half an hour in-ish, maybe, <laughs> and realized that I chuckled a couple times, but I hadn't really laughed. And, you know, we talked about it before the show how they really hit all the characters. All the characters look perfect. <laughs> but it's just not that funny. Uh, I mean, the the physical comedy is amazing. I mean, it is better than anything they do nowadays with physical comedy. Because you know it's just all actual physical comedy. There's no computer bullshit or anything. It's all them, whoever's cast, doing what they do. That's nice. But uh, couldn't get through it, so maybe take a shot of Kraken before you start watching it if you try. What was the name of it again? It's uh, Popeye? Oh, Popeye. God, I'm sorry. I just kind of, yeah. I, 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 I was looking I might at have this. Missed that, actually. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm looking at this damn troll here going, Jesus, where, I pulled this gray out. Where the hell am I supposed to put it? Oh, there's a rock thing on his chest. Got it. Yeah, Popeye. The uh, Robin Williams. So you went into it kind of thinking, well, Robin's passed. Robin Williams. Yep. Hilarious. He, pa- he passed. And I watched that sh- I bet you I watched that show probably 10 or 15 times when I was a kid. Because yeah. back, back in those days... HBO had like four shows on a month. Yep. And so you got to see, that's how I saw um Fistful of let's see Fistful of Dynamite which I think is the sequel to Fistful of Dollars or something or No, this... it's totally different. Okay. Well, it's not it's Fistful of you know they they shouldn't make more than one Fistful of things. So, but anyway, uh I, wa- I bet you I watched that movie 30 times because my parents had just gotten HBO and I was like, <gasps> Oh my God! It's movies over and over and over again. I was so excited, but um, anyway, so yeah, where was I going with that? So yeah, so th- this was a mo- that that too. Popeye was a movie that I had seen about a billion and a half times. Also, yeah, it doesn't age well. Oh, it was funny when I was like ten, but it is not that funny now. No, it's not. So, and again, I was dealing with some heavy stuff, and maybe it just wasn't the right kind of funny. Yeah, you had you had some serious stuff go down during the week, and you know. Instead, I, I think I'm just gonna get a copy of uh, Death to Smoochie and get some legit comedy going. Oh, that's nice. Still with Robin Williams. Um, so I'm painting a, a lightning. Hard to get, but I'm, I'm playing just so the brushheads know I'm painting a lightning troll, and I, and those bones that are across his back, I don't think they should be the same color as his skin. So I painted a bone color. So anyway. Um, I know that one of the flippity boops was how to paint leather, and yes, and I'm just gonna uh, we'll we'll do more on it, John, like you suggested, but um, just real quickly, yeah. bootstrap leather from P3 and Agrex Earthshade. After that, it's kind of immaterial what you do after that, um, because if you do That's just a good start to most, yeah, if you do just those two things, you're gonna be an awful long ways towards awesome. So, uh, bootstrap leather. And Agrex Earthshade are, uh, 
you'll at least make a passable leather. And then we could talk a little bit about highlighting and stuff like that on, on a future episode. So there you go. Um, let's see here. You talk about that, and uh, I understand that uh, you, you got what is potentially the best soundtrack that's come out for a movie in, I don't know, uh, five years, ten years? I, I, I was going to hit something before that, actually. Oh, please do. Real quick. Uh, what I ended up watching that day, aside from every funny video on my computer, I watched uh, an episode of a TV show called Leverage. Have you seen Leverage, John? I have not seen Leverage, but I've heard a lot about it. So tell me a little bit about Leverage. So the, I've seen the pilot. I've seen the first couple episodes, and I've seen stuff here and there. You just catch it on YouTube, clips, and what have you. Um, it is, the basic premise is a insurance you know, uh, auditor sort of guy would mm -hmm. go around and check out claims, make sure they're legit. Um, quits his job because they didn't cover uh, medical for his son when he was diagnosed with a rare disease to get an experimental procedure, so he died. So everything went bad, and he's Aww. fell into the bottle. So he's hired by another guy to, you know, get back proprietary technology that's stolen. So since he knows all about these guys who steal stuff, he gets a bunch of them together and makes sort of like the the dirty dozen of, you know, criminals. And you know, he gets a grifter, he gets a hitter, he gets an uh, intrusion expert, and gets a hacker, and, and, and you know, gets uh, gets the stuff back, you know, does whatever it is. And So is this like Ocean's Eleven, the television show? It is. I was going to say, every episode is kind of like Ocean's Eleven. Holy cow, i got to watch this show. <laughs> It's it's the first season starts off a little slow, but uh, as the characters start to get to know each other, it's really interesting. Um, they actually have oh yeah, Rarekan says uh, uh, says the A team of thieves is sort of like that too. Oh nice. Um, it's got a pretty good cast. I mean, I love uh, the chick who plays uh, Beth Hargrove or something like that who plays their intrusion expert who's totally detached from reality at some points. It's hilarious. You know, they go kind of extreme in their personalities, but have to in a show like that. That's how you get it amusing. Any more extreme She's than Don, any more extreme than Don Cheadle in Ocean's Eleven? Oh, maybe not quite that bad. Don Cheadle goes goes pretty much to eleven. Yeah, he goes he goes up to way eleven on that show. But you know, it's just good fun. Uh, they actually have country singer. Uh, what's his name? Uh, a country singer as their hitter, and he has a pretty good job. Dwight, is, it, is it Dwight Yoakam? I'm trying to remember his name, and I can't. It is not Dwight Yoakam, actually. Because I, I would have thought he'd make uh, a good... Christian Kane? Christian Kane. Don't know who that is. His name? Is it... Is, is it... Uh, it is Christian Kane. He was also in uh, Angel as a bad guy. That sort of raspy voice. It's, it's fairly amusing. One of the episodes, they sort of work that in. He plays their hitter, so he's the... He's the one who just punches people, and it's great. I was going to suggest Miley uh, Cyrus because he might, really he might come moment. on like... I was going to say Miley Cyrus because he might come on like a wrecking ball. But that's not really like country, so... Uh, but it would be funny. No, not really. It, it was funny for me. It was funnier so, in my good head. Cast, um, good cast, amusing times. Not every show is amazing, but that's what you expect. And they're fairly episodic, so you can watch one here or there after you've seen the beginning. And have an idea what's going on. Nice. <laughs> um, so I give it like a shot of crack, and that's an average. There are some episodes that are so amusing. You'll be like, that was just like watching Ocean's Eleven for like 42 minutes and awesome. Well, I'm in because I'm, I'm going to so, suggest this I'm too. I'm for that. I'm, I'm in cause, because Belinda and I have actually been looking to find some new shows to watch. And if it's in Ocean's Eleven is one of my all-time favorite movies. I just love I just love a caper movie. I mean, I love Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. I yes. love I love Snatch. I love all those caper movies, and I have a feeling this is going to be like right in my wheelhouse. So, great suggestion there, John. Yeah, it's good fun. Uh, keep in mind, occasionally it plays fast and loose with reality. Oh yeah, like that's not a, like like that's not something I love. Well, it, it's it, it it brushes that middle ground between. Uh, you know, reality, you know, sometimes like, oh, it's kind of realistic. Then you're like, oh, no, never mind. Because there's a scene in the first episode where basically their hitter does something and they sort of make it seem like it happens in about X amount of time and you know that would never, ever happen <laughs> that fast. Just just wouldn't. But, so there you go. Except one shot of Kraken, it's good stuff. 
You may not even need that whole shot every episode. Well, I'm. I mean, sometimes, sometimes a shot of Kraken, as we've talked about, is is more about just kind of getting yourself into a relaxed mood and getting ready to en- enjoy something, not necessarily how bad something is. So, absolutely. For those um, you want to try it, they have occasionally have episodes on YouTube. Of course, not legally, but it's on Amazon Prime. But you can give it a try. It's also still on TNT in syndication, probably. I told you know, they yeah. could be running episodes. I gotta watch that. That's for sure. Yeah. Leverage sounds amazing. Um, it's super fun. I'll, I'm gonna do one one quick recommendation. Um, I, oh. We didn't talk about this in the uh, in the entrance of the show, but I want to recommend the 20 part interview series, uh, getting personal with with uh, Scott Ray and Trevor Christensen. Um, that uh, that the oh, part? that the chant that the is chant, it 20? It's oh well, is it 12? Yeah, it's twenty dollars, but it's 12, 12 parts. I think it's twelve parts. Yeah, that's it's fine. Twenty, holy crap! It's, it's twelve, um, and it is amazing. I've been listening. I when I was driving to Iowa City, I had uh, a listen to. So I had listened to my own episode because I couldn't remember exactly what the hell I'll, I had actually said on it. Because and that's dangerous. You should probably always know and remember because I was sober even when I did that show, um, <laughs> and I, I have a little bit of a. As I listened to the show, I began to realize that the peop- the regular people who go to cons on a regular basis in the War Machine community probably need to check into Hazleton because we we need we probably need an intervention. There's a lot of people who are drinking way too much in this community, and I realize that this is a this is a drinking show with a painting problem. I get that, and. Uh, but man, some of the stories, it's like one long, I was really wasted when X happened stories. <laughs> and, uh, when I listened to team age and, and that was a humbling experience because Team Age is uh, Tony. Yeah. Tony Riccio. Yeah. And, gotcha. and, uh, episode two. yeah, he's a, he's a director in supply chain for some company and he's smart. I mean, like, really smart. I mean, not even just a little bit smart. He's a lot smart. And uh, and he's way smarter than I am, and I'm not dumb. But he's really super smart. So listen to him and learn something from just listening to him. And, uh, and then I listen, I think my other favorite, they're all good. I mean, go out and get the, tw- get the $20 bundle. Uh, it's going to send these guys to Poland. And so that we can all watch the live stream of the WTC and watch a stream that has more technical problems than painting with <laughs> Menoth John. Because I, I I pray for them. I really do. I can't imagine a universe where this is going to go smoothly. Oh, but, they'll at least have it recorded, even if it doesn't live stream. As long as they bring enough yeah. stuff to record it on, it can be recorded. So. Well, they use OBS and... Apparently, OBS, if you start recording, it starts screwing up the switching cameras, but they can probably muster through that in much the same way that I did. So, um, yeah. But I think they'll do fine. Get out there. Spend the 20 bucks. I mean, really, seriously. You could stop. Have a, Don't have a couple of donuts and buy this because it's really good. And you can get it from, I think it's at uh, just Chain Attack TV, Chain Attack TV. And uh, get out there and support those guys. Send them to Poland so that we can all listen to the WTC. That's my recommendation. Go to the Chain Attack website and, and find it there. It's a couple down right now. I posted a link in the chat room if you're in the chat room right now. Yep. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to hearing the episode 11 with Stuart Gorman, who posts my favorite blog post uh, of ever, which is what other performs this week. Yeah, we. Yeah, that, I actually made that that blog one time. Yes, because you had your ask Menoth John about uh, Protector Menoth. Yeah, I, yeah, that that I have to get back on that thread up. I haven't been there for like a couple weeks, and they start getting lonely for me. Zulu, especially Zulu, Zulu gets way lonely for me. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a little unnatural. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so that's my recommendation. And let's see, you talked about leverage, talk about Popeye, and then of course, awesome the best mix. soundtrack ever. Yeah, awesome mix number one. Yes. Guys, oh. if you don't own this soundtrack, you suck. Go out there and get it. It is the best soundtrack of any movie that I think I've ever listened to. They had it at the game store in Iowa City, and they were playing it before the tournament. And I'm sitting there, and I'm 
I'm enjoying it. I'm singing and all. Saying my head, just feeling old. But I, I mean, I remember when those songs were popular. <laughs> I'm not quite there, but I've heard a lot of them on on the radio in my youth. Yeah. Um, I actually got the two discs, two disc set because it's got the score too. Because I'm a sucker for scores. Nice. I haven't listened to it yet because that required putting the other CD in for any amount of time. <laughs> it's on my computer, but I haven't had a chance yet because I've been listening to Awesome Mix Volume 1. And you know, some of you youngins aren't going to like it because it's older music, but give it a shot. You might just find that you like it. And if you like the music in the movie, you'll like this. You know, if you've seen the movie, you're going to like the music because you'll hearken back to what's actually going on in the, on the screen when, such an, when the music comes on, and it'll, it'll pull you back to that moment. And that movie is just golden. Yep, and, and it's good because all the songs, you hear them and you get in your head the scene that it was at, mm-hmm. which is what you want. I mean, that's, that's the key to making a movie great, 